And I want to welcome everyone who has taken their time out to come and join us for this information session for applicants for the National Clinician Scholars Program. My name is Mary Sue Heileman, and I'm an associate professor at the UCLA School of Nursing. I'm also an associate director for the NCSP program at UCLA, and I'm thrilled that you're all here for our, our information session. I am joined by my colleagues who are going to be helping to engage with all of you and answer any questions you have after I give a presentation. So first, let me ask my colleagues to, uh, who are at uh, Duke and um, Michigan and um, UCLA to introduce themselves. So let's see, let's go ahead and start uh, with Jade. Hi. Um, <clears throat> Hi, I am Jade Burns. I am at the University of Michigan, a uh, site for the NCSP program. I am finishing the fellowship. I'm a second year. Um, do you want to know my research or I'm not sure. I'm, 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 I'm staying here at the University of Michigan. I'm coming on as faculty. Professor Crack, and I study um, um, adolescents and young adults, access to care, special health services, and technology. Thank you. Wonderful. And um, Professor Dina Costa. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Dina Costa. I'm assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing. I'm also one of the co-directors of our Michigan NCSP. Um, my research looks at critical care teams and how we can improve how they work together to deliver high quality care. Wonderful. And professor, uh, the professor at Penn, Dave, are you there? Yeah, hi, uh, this is David Ash, and I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I'm a physician. I was a Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation clinical scholar about 30 years ago, a little longer than 30 years ago, uh, and uh, now one of the directors of this particular program, and I'm a health services researcher. I study mostly behavioral economics. Wonderful. And Dr. Patty Soderlund at UCLA. Hi, I'm Patty Soderlund. I'm completing my first year at the UCLA NCSB program, and my background is nursing, so we really encourage nurses to apply um, if there aren't enough nurses. I'm looking at access to care issues for individuals with um, mental health issues and also a safe and sustainable healthcare system. Great, and, and Dr. Jade Burns, I didn't get a chance to hear your research area. Oh, okay. Um, my research um, area is with adolescents and young adults. Um, I use community-engaged research to, um, along with technology, to improve access to care and sexual health uh, services um, for that population. Wonderful. And then I'll just take a moment to tell everyone what my research is. So again, I'm at the UCLA School of Nursing. And again, for those who have just joined, I am an associate director at the UCLA NCSP program. And um, my research specifically looks at uh, mental health issues, but connecting women to care using media and story-based interventions that are data-informed, meaning they're, they're created based on qualitative data with women from the target group. In my case, that's Latina women struggling with depression and anxiety who have not gotten treatment because of stigma. So, um, so we have a, a wide assortment of, of folks here from our different programs at Penn, Michigan, and UCLA. And what I'd like to do next is I'd like to take everyone through a slide presentation to just give everyone a sense for the program. It covers what our program is and what it involves. And then after that, I'm going to invite folks to, to ask any questions that you have and our panelists will help answer those questions. But before I go forward, does Karen, Samantha, or Ivelisse have any concerns for me? No. no I think you're full speed ahead. Thanks so much, Mary Sue. All right, wonderful. Well, uh, again, this is our May information session and we're just thrilled at all of the nurse applicants who are on, on with us. So here we go. The, the purpose of the NCSP is to advance health and health care through scholarship and action. Next slide, please. We have particular program goals, and the goals are specifically, number one, to cultivate health equity. So make no mistake, every single one of our programs across the United States is focused on improving health equity and eliminating health disparities. 
we also focus on inventing new models of care. And through that, what I mean is that models of care can be challenged in order to achieve higher quality care at a lower cost. And so we're interested in innovations that would come from the mixing of physicians and nurses being together in dialogue, in discussions, learning and innovating. Third, the nurse and physician researchers are, are working in order to become leaders. So they're learning how to collaborate with one another, getting opportunities to collaborate with one another, and this includes our faculty as well as the scholars, but also to work to, for the purpose of becoming leaders who are embedded in communities, in healthcare systems, in government systems at the local, state, or national level, in foundations, or in think tanks. Next slide, please. We are, in fact, interprofessional and interdisciplinary, and we really emphasize that. This is a postdoctoral fellowship program, and we are focused on today's most pressing issues. But as I already said, we are doing that with the special emphasis on being interprofessional. So our goal is to do research, absolutely every scholar does research, but also to use the health research data that we are able to get our hands on to create effective change in health systems, and that can inf involve all kinds of systems within the healthcare environment. Nursing, medicine, psychology, social work, pharmacy, you name it. I just invite everyone to go ahead and mute if you can, thank you. But to create effective change in health systems, but also health policy, and also legislation, and, and practice where it is applicable. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that we are national. We have sites at UCLA, Michigan, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> Connecticut at Yale, Duke <clears throat> in North Carolina, and University of California in San Francisco. However, lucky for all the applicants, there's a single application process and a single selection process. Next slide, please. We do have quite a national network of scholars and alums. And um, Dr. Ash pointed out how we have this network f that we've inherited from the RWJ National Clinician Scholars Program. And we really build on that network as we cre continue to create alumni from our NCSP program who are sort of in, uh, in collaboration and in communication with the RWJ scholars. We do hold an annual national meeting and that is once a year, it's uh, all of the sites come together. It's for the scholars and the faculty. It's an opportunity to see what everybody else is doing at the different sites. It's a, a wonderful, exciting event. This year will be at Penn. The, this fellowship, the NCSP, is a two-year training experience. So it is a full-time two-year program. We do offer strong cohorts with personal connections because every cohort gets to know each other and works with each other in, in small groups, in learning, as well as in doing you know, research projects, writing projects, um, policy projects. And then of course, another emphasis for us is mentorship. Uh, you'll be receiving mentorship in research, in writing, in publishing, scholarship, grants, career advice. We do this in small group meetings and one-on-one and, -on -one and sometimes in large group meetings. Next slide, please. This formula at the top of this slide really captures the key pieces for us. A focus on community, plus a focus on health systems, plus a focus on policy, plus a focus with our academic partners. So we absolutely throughout the program have a commitment to teaching rigorous research design. So whether you do qualitative or quantitative research, whether you do uh, team research, individual research, uh, intervention, descriptive policy, the, there is a heavy focus on rigorous research design and methodology. We ensure that scholars develop a nuanced understanding of how the health system works and how social determinants affect health. We also focus on engaging those who can help apply the research results. So that would mean our community partners or people who are placed in government or other key places uh, across the country to actually make these research results uh, actionable from within systems. We also emphasize the outcomes of research and the impact. We're always talking about the impact. Next slide, please. 
Every scholar who comes into the program at each of our sites is going to be exposed to a variety of things and you see a number of them listed here. Implementation science, communication, policy, patient-centered outcomes. There's a variety of things here. There are certain things that each scholar learns uh, because everybody is learning in a group, but then scholars individualize and become much more specific into what specifically they're needing to accomplish the goals that they're setting forth to uh, tackle with their projects and their interests. So any number of these diverse skills could be the skills that any particular scholar might really focus on. Next slide, please. We have a strong collaboration with the Veterans Administration. Uh, they are one of our strongest partners. They support a number of fellows in each of our NCSP sites. And the fellows have a commitment to conducting research and addressing health and health policies that are relevant to veterans and that reflect the policy, uh, the priority areas for the Department, Department of Veterans Affairs. So the fellows who are working with the VA, they participate in all kinds of activities at the designated VA medical center that's in the vicinity of the NCSP site. Next slide, please. We can go to the next slide, please. Eligibility, uh, whoops, we can go back to eligibility. Nurses who have completed their doctoral degree within five years uh, at the time of application, so that would mean someone who finished their doctoral degree at 2014 or later, whether it's a PhD or a DNP, are eligible to apply. So you would apply, apply now, and this would begin the process of review, and the, the, uh, the fellowship wouldn't begin until next year, so that would be in July 2020. Also, physicians are eligible who have completed their clinical training within five years at the time of application, again, 2014 or later, and um, this includes general surgeons in their research years. There is a, a website there, our national website, uh, nationalcsp.org, uh, you can click there for more information. Next slide, please. And then this slide really gives a vision for where do our scholars go after they finish their NCSP doctor, postdoctoral fellowship, where do they go? Most commonly, they go to one of these uh, five places, either academic research, or they move on to the federal government. Some go to the state or the local uh, government or public health departments. Some go into hospital leadership. Others go into private industry. And this is a very diverse group of opportunities. And people do all kinds of different things. And it really depends on what their interest is and what they've been angling for as they go, uh, as they go forward in the program. So there's lots of different things that people do. Next slide, please. So as you know, our applications are open and uh, they opened up on May 1st and they are due by 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on July 15th. Then those will be reviewed in a rigorous process and some and applicants who are invited will be interviewing between September 3rd and October 4th of 2019. And then invited applicants will submit their site preferences later, that will be on October 8th, uh, 2019. And then by November, they will be notified if uh, they have been accepted. And then entry begins on July 1, 2020. And that's in one of our NCSP sites. Next slide, please. And that is our concluding slide that just gives you a few shots of uh, different scholars and faculty, different groups. Uh, some of these are from our national annual meeting. There's uh, some variety of scholars here and faculty. And that concludes the PowerPoint. But what I'd like to do is ask if we can go back to the previous slide with the dates, because I think that's the one that uh, a lot of folks wanna look at. And why don't we go ahead and open this up to questions and so if a person has a question, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I'm gonna ask Ivalice and Karen, how do you wanna handle questions? So um, generally, Mary Sue, someone will typically speak up from the audience and just identify themselves and, and provide their questions, so. Okay, sounds good. Great, thank you. So are there any questions from anyone who is um, attending our seminar today? 
Hi, my name is Asma Taha. And, um, you know, the, the connection was going on and off for a little bit. So basically, one of the conditions that you have to be within five years from a graduation from a PhD or the NTU program? Yes. That's okay. correct. Thank you. Anyone else have any question at all? We have both faculty from nursing and faculty from medicine here and scholars. Looks like Gillian. Hi, my name is Jillian Adinsky. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of North Carolina and a Hillman Scholar. Um, I saw on your website that a couple of the clinical scholars programs had opportunities to get master's programs along the way during this postdoctoral fellowship. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And would one of our faculty like to take that on? Or, or scholars? Yeah. Sure, I'm happy to. Great. So this is, you know, that's a great question, Jillian. So um, yes, all of the programs have the opportunity for a master's. The actual master's degree that you end up getting differs a little bit um, uh, across the sites, right? So at Michigan, you get a, a master's in health and healthcare research. Um, I think at Penn, it's a master's in health services. David, you can correct me if I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, health policy research at Penn. Great. And then uh, Mary Sue, I'm not quite sure about the one at UCLA, but right. Uh, so the actual degree differs a little bit, but the training is going to be pretty consistent. Um, and so there's also differences across the sites in terms of whether it's sort of required as part of the, the program or whether there is the option to audit. And so at Michigan specifically, we highly encourage all of the scholars to um, matriculate and take a master's program because we think it's really uh, important to the overall training. Um, for the nurse scholars particularly, we have a little bit of flexibility because many of the nurse scholars are coming in with PhDs and depending on what the PhD is in, may or may not um, need sort of the coursework or need another master's. And so we, for the nurse scholars, allow some flexibility at Michigan. We again, so highly encourage them to audit um, and particularly because that maintains the cohort effect, which is one of the major benefits of the NCSP, is learning with nurses and physicians um, in ways to improve health and healthcare. Um, this, is, this is Jade. Um, I can speak to whether in, in my position, like to get the degree or to not get the degree. Um, I chose to get the degree. Um, uh, the person um, who is in a first year, um, wow. I'm trying to start my video. Okay. <laughs> okay. So again, I'm Jade. Um, so I did get the degree here from Michigan. Um, I wanted to have an intense training with the, the statistical component. I'm more of a qualitative researcher, but I wanted to at least understand better. Um, in, oh, sorry, my text message. Um, in my training, like I wanted to do mixed methods and this was like the start of all of that. Um, so it was important for me to be with my cohort. Um, for some of the classes, I did not um, sit in on those sessions, like like social determinants of health. Like a lot of the stuff that I do is community based, and I work in Detroit, so I see a lot of the things that go on with the urban environments. Um, but in terms of um, some of the policy focus, which was new to me, um, the statistical analysis and component was very important to me. Like I wanted to come to all those classes. I wanted to get that um, rich training. Um, but the partner, um, the person who, um, who, is, who is now first year, she's not getting those things. So she's spending more time with writing grants and some things um, that she wants to focus on. But it just depends on what you wanna do as a scholar. And they're very flexible in terms of um, how to package that or how to get that specific training for you. Dave, did you wanna say about Penn? Sure. I mean, it's a, a sort of very similar uh, concepts at, at, as at Michigan. I mean, we, we totally encourage and pretty much require the master's degree for all people. Um, but uh, many people have different kinds of training that means that really don't have to do introductory statistics again, and you can waive various courses. But the cohort effect is pretty important, and, and we think the socialization is critical. And it's not a kind of, um, at least the way we structure our master's degree, it largely propels people forward to advance their research. It isn't, it isn't a kind of empty coursework. It's connected to, to individual scholarly programs. So it, is, it doesn't actually so much compete with other kinds of activities as 
enhance and boost that. So we feel pretty comfortable about those issues there. Wonderful. And let me just address UCLA. So at UCLA, uh, the master's is in health policy, health management, and it's in the School of Public Health. And we have recently gotten feedback from our scholars and are in the process of, of changing a little bit of the the program to meet more accurately the scholars' needs. And similar to what um, Dave and Dina said, uh, we're, if, if a scholar comes in with a very strong background in health policy, then they, they sometimes can be, they might not have to take some of the courses that are, would be redundant to them. But similar to exactly what Dave and Dina said, Scholars find that taking the coursework gives them an opportunity to really get to know their their cohort and they grow together. But also, in particular, we're hoping that these courses are things that you haven't had access to before. And so they, we want these courses to be of interest. And so they're very specifically on health policy, health systems, health management. Um, real quick. Uh, sure. Mary Sue, Dina, or David, um, I don't know if we can look at the chat too in terms of if anybody's asking questions. I know someone who I know is on the chat had a question that um, are the interviews in person? Um, how many applicants are selected each year? Um, and I think that's it. If, if, if either one of you or all three of you could address that because I know it's specific to each site. Sure. Uh, Dave, did you want to jump on that? Um, sure. Uh, so uh, we do interviews, so um, uh, as was stated earlier, we have a common application to the program. When you apply to the program, you identify which of the sites you might be interested in. Uh, so you can say, I'm interested in Yale and Michigan, but I'm not interested in Penn, or I'm uh, not interested in UCLA, and you get to pick which sites that you're most interested in. And the sites themselves will evaluate the applications, and in a kind of not, it's not speed dating, but in a kind of match, you will you uh, may be invited for interviews at some of the sites that you've selected. Obviously, you won't be invited to interview at a site you're not interested in. So then there are in-person uh, interviews, and there'll be each site will have a couple of dates when interviews can take place. Um, I can come back to you know what I think is a good strategy for interviews, but uh, at, and at that point. Um, uh, uh, you know, there's just, a, you know, you'll, you'll spend a day at a site or a half a day at a site and really get to know the existing scholars, the faculty, the resources there. Uh, and uh, the sites will vary in terms of how many applicants they will take. At Penn, we generally take around six to eight. I think the UCLA site tends to take more, and I'm not sure I could speak directly about the other sites, but that would be in general, uh, that's that's how it would generally work at Penn, and I think most of the sites would work in a similar way, but some of the other uh, program directors and faculty and scholars on this particular call can comment on that. But the, the site, <clears throat> the interview is really a critical thing, and it's really critical for every all parties because fundamentally, the sites and the applicants have exactly the same interests. They wanna figure out, is there a good match? Like, are there mentors for me here? Uh, that's what an applicant would want to know. Can I develop and flourish? Is this a place to really accelerate and boost my career? And of course, the sites want to know the same thing. Is this person likely to succeed here? Are they likely to be successful? Do we have the resources to support them? And so uh, in that sense, the, uh, these visits, uh, everybody's incentives are aligned, which is to try to ask the question, is, you know, do we have a match? Is this a good fit? I'll pause there. Sure. Dina, do you want to? Sure. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I'll be unmute myself. Um, so I agree with kind of pretty much what David said. Michigan, the number of people that we have in our cohort ranges anywhere between seven to nine, depending on the year. Uh, we have funding for around one to two, um, sometimes three, that hasn't happened yet, um, nurse scholars. Um, but the interviews are in person. It, you spend uh, pretty much about a day meeting with the current program director, uh, Rod Hayward, and our, uh, the other co-directors as well, um, meeting past graduates of the NCSP program as well as potential faculty um, that you might be uh, potentially partnered with uh, or working with um, in a, uh, as having them as their, your mentor. Um, so yeah, 
Okay, so I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. So I would, I would just say that each of the sites uh, takes this, you know, very seriously, just as Dina and Dave said. And the interview day is a full day of activities. And you're there with a cohort of other people who are interviewing. And everybody's interviewing in different ways, in different sessions. And each site will uh, create a day for this. And um, it's, it's exciting. It's fun. It's also informative, just as, as Dave and Dina said. At UCLA, we typically have uh, 10 slots. And I think across the United States at all six sites, I think that typically uh, a portion of those have historically been nurses, as, as Dina said, somewhere between one and three nurses and the rest are, are physician um, candidates. However, it all depends on the quality of the applicants and on the match, as Dave said. And so those numbers are not set in stone. It's, it's literally based on the match and the application. And um, we wanna, wanna hear from Jade and Patty if they wanna say something, but then I think it would be great to come back to Dave because he, he certainly had, he suggested he has some ideas about, about interviewing strategies. But Jade or Patty, yeah. did you wanna say anything? Yeah, I'd like to um, jump in just as someone who has been through the interview process. Um, you know, it's something I won't lie, it's a little bit nerve wracking going into, but I can't tell you what a wonderful experience it ended up being. Um, I did a lot of research about the program prior to going in, um, but you will also have access to faculty, um, past graduates that you will be interviewing with, and I highly recommend you do your research because what you'll, what really works is think about how your past experiences have contributed to your current goals and how those current goals can contribute to where you see yourself in the NCSP. And what I happened to find was a, real, um, a really good match with the Department of Mental Health, who's my sponsor. And we just had a great time interviewing, thinking of project ideas. And that's when you, you, know, you know the interview is going well. So you do have an opportunity to do a lot of homework. But as far as the actual interview day, I just want to emphasize like what a great experience. You really do get a feel for that program site. If you have the opportunity, interview each place because each site is quite different and has a different feel. Um, and it's just a great day where you have the opportunity to just you know, mingle with other people who are interviewing. Um. All right, Jade. Yep, I would like to chime in too. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know, if, uh, um, Patty, right? Uh, if you like, if she felt the same way, um, it was different. It was a real different interview process. I'm used to the one-on-one -on -one or maybe two or three people. Um, at Michigan, I'm, I'm just describing how it is. Um, I came in there. I had the other um, individuals who were interested in the Michigan site. Um, and like we went from room to room to room to interview with just amazing people, whether they were the co-directors or people outside of the discipline. Um, I also had phone calls um, in terms of the interview process. Um, I know now that at Michigan, um, we, you know, you present, you present your research to the school so that they can see what you're um, working on. Um, and in terms of how it integrates with the, the, the school's mission, vision and values and NCSD. Um, I thought that was, that was very engaging as well. Um, like I said, it was very long and, and, and the questions weren't, the questions were just really like, you know, you just really had to think, you know, in terms of how are you really going to do in this NCSP program? I mean, they were really asking me questions. I just, I just didn't even know, you know, so, but at the end of the day, I'm like, wow, like if they're asking me questions like this at the interview process. Like imagine what, you know, if I come up with my proposal or if I'm with my peers, how the discussion was going to be. So that got me really excited at the end. Um, and it was, it was very well worth it, so. All right, so before we shift over to Dave and his interviewing strategies, does anyone else have a question that you'd like to ask? And Jade, thank you so much for checking the, the, um, the comments. And if you see a new question in there, would you let us know? Um, I have a couple questions on the chat. Okay. One is from uh, Sarah Zalwig. She says she's curious about the clinical piece of the program. Um, she says she hasn't practiced clinically in a few years and she's interested in the public health aspect. Um, and the side of nursing. So she's curious what type of clinical training uh, she might be able to do in the program. All right, Dina. Yeah, sure. So we have had, um, so we have one, 
uh, Sue Ann Bell was our first scholar, Jade Burns was our second, and Jin June is our third scholar, particularly for, for nurses. Um, and I can, I'll speak to that because I, I believe Sarah um, is a nurse. Um, and so the way that we handle it at Michigan is dependent upon the scholar's interest. So Sue Ann Bell does work in emergency preparedness. And so Sue Ann Bell sort of deploys to emergency um, areas uh, through FEMA, through sort of this work that she does at FEMA. And so that comes up, right, that's a little bit less uh, predictable. Um, and so Sue Ann engaged throughout the, the NCSP doing doing that clinical work. Um, Jade, if you want to maybe talk a little bit about the clinical work that you do, the third scholar, Jin, does not currently practice clinically, um, and that's just sort of her choice. And so we're open to facilitating uh, whatever clinical partnerships um, our scholars are interested in. And I think Jade's personal experience might be um, helpful in illustrating that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I clinically, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. I've been practicing for about 10 years now. And um, and so I have like deep roots within, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep emphasizing that within the community. Um, so the first year, I, I really didn't practice during the academic year um, because I really wanted to focus on the co uh, the coursework, um, you know, the, the networking, um, the one-on-one -on -one peer support and um, uh, mentoring support. Um, I did keep the relationships up uh, with that community. I, that's where I did my research. But during the summertime is where I did um, practice. I practice once a week on a Friday, either a half a day or a whole day. And, and that seemed to me, for me, the summertime was just more of a downtime because the, the year round is, is more intense. Now um, I'm really focusing on my community based, um, you know, research. Um, I have the option to practice, but I am a researcher. So now I'm, I'm, I'm focusing more on researching, um, you know, the research projects. But there is you know, like if I need to do something contingent within that, that same frame, I could do so. But I do advise people like to reserve that year um, to, you know, to really focus. A lot of the people, so I, I was the only nurse, but the other, the other people in there were physicians. Um, they had service, they had calls. So you would see them do something for like two weeks and then they would be off for a, an extended amount of time. So um, everyone practiced at some point or another, but it just wasn't like, 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 you know, you did 20 hours of practice or whatnot. It was more focusing on the scholarship and the fellowship. Patty uh, or Dave? Yeah, yeah as, um, as I said before, I'm sponsored by the Department of Mental Health. And um, well, my experience as well, um, my background as a psych nurse practitioner, um, I have worked out in the community quite a bit, but most recently my experience has been more teaching, a little less clinical. Um, so I also had a similar question as you. Um, but what I found, one, I had this discussion um, with, uh, with my sponsor during my interview, and they kind of get a sense for where you're at. And so we knew going into this that I was going to see what their mission and goals were, and we just kind of figured out a position for me as um, within six months, something that I'd be happy with, something that would benefit them and help them develop their program because I was placed within um, a field-based program, which is public health, which I loved, it's psych. And I'm working on QI, QA projects with them that are helping them kind of grow as a program. So I do think it's very individual depending on what site you go with, but I did find um, it was very relaxed as far as it's um, a very mutual kind of growth that happens, you know, within the first six months, possibly to a year. And everybody has different requirements as to how many hours. Mine, I do eight hours a week, um, but I do enjoy going in there and um, it's very beneficial. I'm growing as a result as well. So, and before we move to Dave at Penn, let me just add, because Patty's at UCLA and, and I'm also at UCLA. So what the UCLA site does, our, our sponsors, there's different sponsors who, who fund different slots of scholars. And that might be a hospital organization, or as in Patty's case, the LA Department of Public Health, uh, Mental Health, excuse me. But we also have the Department of Health Services for LA County. And so every scholar at UCLA does about eight hours a week. So physicians may be actually working in an ER or working in psych emergency. But for the nurses, like Patty described, we, we recognize that nurses with a PhD or a DNP are at a pretty high level of functioning. 
and they often have lateral uh, vision in, in that they're looking at the group or at the, the departmental effect. And so their clinical expertise can actually be used, like in Patty's case, to look at QI and look at a whole system. Um, and, you know, Kristen Choi was involved at Kaiser and she became involved in creating a psych emergency team. She also became involved in an analysis of, of uh, patients who are diagnosed with autism. And so it was more project oriented. And so her clinical hours went into projects related to clinical groups. How is it at, at Penn, Dave? Sure. Well, I could say a couple of things, maybe even historically, about why do we even have a clinical? Why, why is this called the National Clinician Scholars Program? And why, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable question. What does, what does being clinical mean? And, and why would we have that in the program? And partly it's historical and vestigial from when it was the Robert Wood Johnson funded clinical scholars program. And now at that time, it was only physicians. And all the physicians maintained some kind of clinical activity. Now, the, the, the cultures in, in medicine and nursing are slightly different. It's uh, many people stay at, who are physicians and move into positions of research or leadership, um, hold on to uh, uh, a direct clinical role. Uh, that is not as true in uh, nursing academics or nursing leadership as it is true in medicine. But partly the program was designed to produce people who are going to be leaders uh, in the health and healthcare space, and partly it was oppositional to the view that all policy is going to be created by, for example, economists. And the idea of this program has fundamentally been that people who have some kind of clinical background and clinical experience have something special to offer that really, um, uh, you know, makes them much more able to do things, or at least to complement the kinds of activities that would be provided by non-clinicians. And so, maintaining some kind of clinical connection whether it's through your historical background, but, but also typically through some kind of engagement with clinical programs was necessary. Now, how that gets created at Penn and how that gets created at the other programs has, has evolved as we've introduced nursing into the program. Uh, and uh, I, I guess our view at Penn is that some of our nurses engage in programs that are fundamentally clinical in terms of delivering care directly to patients. In other cases, they are working with clinical programs, whether they are a clinician or provider themselves uh, is less relevant. So, but, but some kind of clinical grounding we've seen is essential to the ideology of this program and to what we, how we measure success. And that may be useful to the background of why we even have this at all. We, you know, this could have been a program that would also include people who were trained in political science. It's all perfectly relevant to healthcare or sociology or economics, uh, but we wanted to keep it focused on clinicians. Wonderful. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I have one from Tommy Flynn on the chat. Um, he was curious about uh, the logistics of relocating to an NCSP site in terms of housing costs, health insurance, and financial responsibilities. He says he read that there was a, st a stipend, but is it the same amount whether the site is California or North Carolina or Connecticut, et cetera? So this may be a question for Ivelisse. Hi, sorry, I had to unmute myself. So um, there is a the there is a stipend across all the sites. It is a standard stipend at stipend at this point across the sites. The only distinction is um, scholars who are VA scholars get a slightly higher stipend because their health insurance costs are slightly higher. But across the sites, uh, across the different regions of the country, it is the same stipend, and you can find information about that on our um, FAQ page on the website. In terms of housing relocation, unfortunately, we're not able to provide funding for housing relocation. You can certainly reach out to your site for advice and you know, certainly can canvas faculty there and scholars and so forth for suggestions, um, and that often is the case. But um, there isn't separate funding. But as I mentioned, as I alluded to when I was talking about the distinction between um, VA scholar funding, we do provide health insurance. Health insurance is provided as well through the program. Did I answer all the questions? And please, those of you, the faculty and scholars at the sites, please chime in. I think you covered it, but does anyone else want to add from our faculty and scholar team? Um, okay. Well, I just want to say something about housing. I know at Michigan, like everybody who's applied to Michigan, like everybody's been very, very helpful in terms of, um, we had a lot of people who from out of state, um, of setting people up with realtors, 
um, in term, and then like um, in terms of housing, there's graduate housing or graduate level housing that's available um, off campus, on campus, or family housing um, if you do have a family. Um, and so, and, and then there are places outside that are just on the borderline of Ann Arbor per se that a lot of the scholars where they live at. So I, I, I've seen a lot of scholars just really help each other out in terms of finding the housing. We, we, get, we usually get like five or six emails like after they've been accepted and people just, it's flooded with resources. So I don't know if it's the same at the other sites, but it's pretty helpful. Yeah, I would say that what, what tends to happen is that networking and uh, you really need to talk to the, the folks at the specific sites to find out what resources are. But I, we have such an amazing team of, of staff and also of the scholars who are wanting to help those who are new and fresh and coming along that I think there's a, a wonderful tradition of people sharing that kind of information with each other, especially once you're, you're selected and, and really trying to find the opportunities of where to find what's going to be a match for you. Any other questions? Hi, um, this is Dr. Mansfield. I'm a PhD candidate at Duke University School of Nursing. Um, I had a question regarding the letters of references for the application process. Um, I see one of the references says it must be a program director of your present or most recent clinical training program or a current clinical supervisor where you currently provide clinical service. Um, for the PhD um, students, are in the nursing program many of us are full-time and we don't practice so who would be that person that will satisfy that re requirement you know again maybe Ivelisse you should weigh in here um, and uh, Dave and Dina as well but it's it's not uncommon for people to if they are practicing to have someone who is in their practice area but also Sometimes, as you pointed out, nurses are involved in research and they are, they're doing research or they're on a team and so they might have their program director of that research team. Um, but Ivelisse, Dave, and, and Dina, please speak in here. I'm going to defer, this is Ivelisse, I'm going to defer more to Dave and Dina, but Mary Sue, I was going to say something along the same lines as you. Yeah, I don't really have much to add. Um, I think that uh, I think the responses we've heard are, are good. Yeah. I think it, 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 oh, go ahead, Dina. Sorry. I think um, also too what we've seen is sometimes program directors of the PhD program, right? Write a letter of reference for the nursing scholars, and that's another option, right? You can have your your mentor or your chair write a letter. The PhD program director who knows you in a slightly different capacity than your your faculty mentor and faculty dissertation chair, um, uh, sort of provide uh, commentary on that um, uh, has also been, has worked fine. Right, and so you're, you're definitely wanting to have letters of recommendation that are from people who can showcase the different aspects of your strengths and talents. And so, as Dina pointed out, of course, your, your dissertation chair is a, is a great choice because they can speak about all kinds of aspects of your abilities, but someone else who can see you from another perspective that can can showcase as many aspects of of your talents and strengths um, but also because they are able to compare you to a group i think that's the the intention behind having this other uh, person of a different position write that kind of a letter anything else from dave or dina jade or okay any other questions Hi, Juliana Dinsky again. Um, I had a question about um, the ability to take time off or get vacation time or even just work remotely. Does this program function more like being a student if you're getting a master's program along the way or is this something that you'd have to formally request time off for if you were to try to sneak away for a long weekend or something like that? Jade, it looks like you're wanting to say something but don't want to put you on the spot. I don't know, you were, you were nodding and... Well, it's really cool. I mean... I mean, like, I don't know, like, you know, people had, you know, um, children, like babies um, during the program. So people were pregnant. And, and, um, but as long as you're getting the work done, I mean, you're responsible. It's, it's, a, it's, post, it's like postdoc or post, it's a fellowship. So um, I've enjoyed my time. I've gone on conferences, quite a few conferences, both research-based and for clinically-based as well. Um, 
I have, I'm in, I'm in the office now at the School of Nursing, but um, at Michigan, they provide a space for you um, at Institute of Health Policy and Innovation. Um, and I'm sure the other sites provide, you know, working spaces for their scholars. And I would come there, I'd work on the weekends, I, you know, you know, you have to be at the classes if, you, if you're taking the classes. Um, and if you're missing them, like, so for, if I had to do something that involved the work that I do within the city or at the clinics in terms of my research, I would just email someone and say, hey, I'm missing this Wednesday session. Like for Michigan on Wednesdays, it would have all these really great speakers come in from different fields, um, not just like academia, but like the industry and those type of things. You don't want to miss those type of uh, workshops. But as long as you come to your classes and fulfill like the requirements, it's, it, you have a lot of autonomy. And I, I, I'm a type of person, I, I work a lot of hours. Like I like, I work 24 eight, but I'm not a nine to five person. I think that this program promotes the flexibility and um, <clears throat> you know, so you can do what you need to do. Dave, did you have something? Well, I, I agree. I mean, uh, in the early years of the program, we tried, you know, uh, chaining the scholars to the radiator. Uh, and that just seemed a little <laughs> cruel and really unnecessary. Uh, you know, we would give them water and scraps of crusts of bread and stuff. But so now we have a much more humanistic view. But but more seriously, I mean, this is an adult education program. And, and except for things like formal coursework, um, you know, the whole idea is to make use of the time effectively. And that includes having some work-life balance. So I don't think that's an issue. I, I you know, uh, uh, it is, is a time when, frankly, a lot, a lot of our scholars are uh, having babies at any one time or another, uh, just because of the age and, and uh, there are natural breaks that have to occur for that. And, and we make those things work. Uh, you know, I think it's a very forgiving program in that way. But on the other hand, this is like, a, I would say this almost as a way to sell the program. You will never have a more precious time for your career than a program like this. Mm -hmm. There will never be another time in your career where you have two years or so completely devoted to enhancing the development, your professional development. And so making effective use of that uh, is really, um, you know, uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to eat your seed corn. That is like a, it's like a critical time. Now, that doesn't mean you don't, don't get to go on vacation and go away for long weekends or have a baby if that's a part of your plans. Um, but this is a really precious time when it is all about you. Think of it as a kind of two-year rejuvenation and spa time, uh, following some, you know, hard training and, and consolidation of your um, uh, academic plans towards the new opportunities and new abilities to contribute. It really is a special time, and that does include having some time off and uh, mm -hmm. recreating and, and work-life balance and the like, because those are lifelong lessons uh, uh, that you need as well. And yeah. um, just going to say one more comment really quick. Dave and Jade, you did a really nice job summarizing that. I just want to point out there are a couple key dates on the calendar. And what I do is I just mark those off knowing that those are dates that I need to be available. Otherwise, many things are flexible, especially if it's just a long weekend. But you can plan like as far as the annual conference, um, your protocol meeting, you know, there are some very specific key dates. But um, I would say it's absolutely flexible to an adult learning environment. Yeah, and we want you to get the most out of the program. So like a great example is uh, one of the incoming scholars had emailed and we do at Michigan, we do about a six, I think it's a six week summer intensive starting July one, where we sort of immerse you in um, sort of everything that University of Michigan has to offer. And we have a bunch of faculty that come in and give talks about um, their, their programs of research, et cetera. And it's a way to help build the cohort, but also sort of get you connected to potential resources, mentors, uh, research centers, et cetera. And so one of the incoming scholars had said, you know, I'm presenting my dissertation at a conference for the, uh, in a week, at a week in August. You know, is that okay that I miss the well, week of the summer intensive? And so, and not that there was, it didn't, there, my permission wasn't needed, but it was a conversation in which we could say, you know, this, that's a higher priority at this moment, right? Because you're going to be disseminating your science. And that's the goal sort of of this program is getting you increasing your profession, you're growing yourself as a professional. And part of that is in, um, including getting out there and, and talking about your work. Right. <clears throat> and I would just add that as the program continues, each scholar is moving uh, so there's the coursework and of course that's that's key but you're also co collaborating with community partners or academic partners 
uh, to do research, to do some policy projects. Most scholars are doing two, three, four, sometimes five different projects. And that's on you. you know, you're going to set up that schedule. That's going to be based on you and your collaborators and what works for you all. And so basically, uh, you're the master of that schedule. You, you, you know, and as, as Dave pointed out, this is a really phen phenomenal time of great opportunities. So people find a way to make it work. Any other questions, either from the chat or anyone else who wanted to speak up and ask something? We have just a few minutes left. Um, I know that Dave mentioned some interviewing techniques and I, I'm very curious to hear about that. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to share that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I probably built it up more than I needed to. Um, I, I do think that, I guess I was gonna say this, that the, I've often thought that, the, for, that your participation in the National Clinician Scholars Program really begins in a lot of, for a lot of people who are going to end up in that program, it begins on the interview day. And it can be, it, it can begin on the interview day at Michigan, even if you end up at Penn. It can begin on the interview day that you have at UCLA, even if you don't end up in the program. And the reason I say that is that you get connected in a kind of one-on-one -on -one and group setting to a bunch of people who were thinking often in the way you're thinking. And sometimes that's the first time you've met a bunch of kindred spirits. And I guess uh, my experience is that a lot of applicants, so if you meet them in the beginning of the interview day, you have a different experience with the applicant than if you meet them at the end of the interview day, in part because their thinking is being transformed during the process of the visit. And of course, then they'll go to Yale, and then they'll go to Michigan, and then they'll go to UCSF, and they'll meet, go to a couple of different sites, and they'll be transformed even further. And I think you should look upon these... Um, visits not only as something to like to present yourself well but probably more importantly to think about how you can use the people you're engaging with to like sharpen your ideas and 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 uh and get new influences uh i i think that's honestly some of the longest term relationships happen in the context of being interviewed for um uh you know one of these positions now, I, I would say that advice is relevant also when people are going off on job searches, that they're visiting various places to look for a more permanent job, not, a, not just a, like the National Clinician Scholars Program. And I would give the same advice there too, which is that you could see those visits as ways to um, you know, connect with people. I, I would say even in my own experience, when I was, a, I was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, and then towards the end of that, I went on the job market to look for my first job as an assistant professor. And I went around the country and I was visiting places. Well, it turns out some of those connections I made during those visits uh, became enduring. Some of those people ended up writing letters for my promotion and tenure and things like that. And so those can, you should think about those, um, the people you engage with at these sites who are almost all, they, I don't say almost all, they're all at the top of their game um, as a resource and uh, as actually part of the program. And I think uh, that takes a little bit of the edge off of it, uh, but at the same time increases the contribution that the interview day can provide to your own career. That's the way I would think about it, is to be genuine, um, uh, to actually use the, use the people you meet at, to help you along, and that's really one of the best ways to figure out, frankly, whether the program, that particular program, or those particular people are a good fit uh, to, uh, 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 for people to work with. So that's my advice. It's not uh, nothing very strategic in the sense of like, how do I get in? But it definitely is about a life strategy or a career strategy. Wonderful. Dina, it looks like you have some. Yeah. And I was going to say, so the national, the, the national CSP, um, Twitter account, I don't know if any of you are on Twitter, um, is doing in the, I just participated in one and they've got a couple more coming up in the next month, all the way up through, the summer and so up until the application deadline in which they have featured faculty and so faculty from across all of the different sites take over um, and provide some tips um, for applicants they address any questions they talk about the program and so I encourage you like I said I just did one last Friday so if you want to hear a bunch of stuff about wonderful Ann Arbor Michigan you can go check that out that's on the national account um, and then just keep it keep an eye out um, because there are some tips sort of embedded throughout uh, the Great. And I would just add, um, 
you know, we presented a, a variety of things in this, this web presentation, and I believe it's being recorded and it'll be available online. And, and each of the websites has information. But, you know, believe what you read. This is a program, you know, I'm speaking now to nurses who often haven't been exposed extensively to health policy or health management or systems issues. But this is a program for you to gain something that you didn't have before. And so think when you're writing your application, think about that. How are my ideas uh, and my background and my interests, how are they going to influence issues related to systems or health disparities across systems, health management, policy? Think that through, spend time with you know, this webinar information, but also other website information and in uh, addressing that directly and and work with the people who are writing your letters of recommendation talk with them make sure that they understand the goals of the program so that they're really thinking through your potential match with the program so be intentional about it you know taking into account all the things that were said today in in particular the last two from from Dina and Dave but others and I think we have two minutes left and Jade or Patty do you have anything that you want to Last words, last advice. Um, apply. Um, <laughs> apply, that's why we're here to, to talk with you today. Um, that's pretty much it. I, I've had a few people through the Twitter um, accounts and some of the things like the when we did Twitter Takeover, feel free to you know send me a direct message or follow me at Jade C. Burns. I've had, I've had, a, I've had a couple people actually reach out, um, it, you know, and it was very easy. You know, if you don't want to send me an email or whatnot, um, I mean, it's that, it's that informal. We're, we're all here to help you. So um, apply, apply. Right. This is a great opportunity for nursing. It's, it hadn't been open to nursing before. And it's just in the last three, three, four years that it's open to nursing. It's a wonderful opportunity. You are a bit of a pioneer coming in, but we are all embracing this. Our physician colleagues embrace it. Our national board embraces it. It's their idea. That's why this is an interprofessional program. Patty. Anything. Yeah, and I just wanted to second that. If anyone would like to reach out to me, um, email is best. Um, what I want to say, what really drove my interview and what I came in with, and we were talking about being genuine during the interview, which everybody is extremely genuine. What really drove um, me is coming in with experiences that I've encountered in the healthcare system. And I think that's what nurses really come in with is that we have such a dynamic experience. Um, and when I had this one goal addressing healthcare access issues, this kept coming up and up throughout my career. And just starting that discussion um, just really opened so many doors and um, really opened up discussion during my interview. Wonderful. And I think it just echoing in the, our last few seconds here that nurses are unique with the way that we come at healthcare and how we work with patients and our physicians colleagues uh, really value the opportunity to collaborate with us. So this is a wonderful opportunity. We welcome your applications. We hope to see them all. I want to thank everyone on our panel for all of their time. I want to thank every single one of you that tuned in. And um, we look forward to seeing your applications. I also want to thank our amazing staff, uh, Ivelisse, Karen, Samantha, everyone who helped make this possible, Casey. So thank you all so much. And I think we've come to the end of our time. So we will say goodbye from the NCSP. And we look forward to seeing those applications. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mary Q.